I am so excited to talk to you about this book. This is one of those books that's both full of information and incredibly conversational at the same time. I found myself wanting to highlight every other sentence because every word was so important and meaningful. Hi, I'm Lori Sulpizio with the Conscious Leadership Academy at the University of San Diego. We're working hard to bring you really good informational and engaging content. So hit that subscribe button and hit the bell icon so you get alerts when we post new videos. We're really happy to have you as a part of our conscious community. Before we dig into the material in this book, let me tell you a little bit about the author, Emmanuel Ocho. Emmanuel is the son of two Nigerian immigrants, and he grew up in Dallas, Texas. He acknowledges his privileged family, the positive impact of having two very present parents, and being well-educated. He was drafted in the NFL by the Cleveland Browns, and he also played with the Philadelphia Eagles. He earned a master's degree in sports psychology at the University of Texas during his off-season. This man is one cool dude. The book came from a video series that he began in May, after the murder of George Floyd. The series was so popular and made such an impact, he turned it into a book. He gets real with us in this book and doesn't sugarcoat the necessary and important work that we, the white people, have to do to begin to fight the pandemic that is racism. I'm going to use a lot of his words because they're just so great, and I'll let you know when I'm putting in my own thoughts and ideas on the topics he's talking about. Lastly, even if you like this video, which I hope you do, I really encourage you to read the book. I'm going to cover parts that feel the most important, that resonated most deeply with me thinking this is the stuff white people need to listen to and understand, but he gives so many examples and digs into the history in a way the video won't do. So please, get the book, read it, listen to it on Audible. Every word is worth hearing. So let's dig in. Acho comes out of the gate and calls us on the importance of fighting racism and oppression. He tells us that the longest lasting pandemic in this country is a virus not of the body, but of the mind, and it's called racism. And he's right. While we're rushing to find a vaccine for COVID-19, we should be pursuing with equal determination a cure for the virus of racism and oppression. What's great is that he says an important part of the cure is to talk to each other. I love this because it's something we can all do. It's an accessible action. He says the goal of the book is to build relationships and recognize each other's humanity. And he's right that it's tough, if not impossible, to hold bigoted thoughts about somebody whose humanity you recognize. This actually reminds me of something Brene Brown talks about. She says people are hard to hate close up, so move in. Move in is exactly what we're going to do as we explore the uncomfortable conversations he offers in this book. The goal is for us to have an increased understanding of race after reading this book, to have deeper understanding of the history the black people have gone through, and to recognize the impact of the past on our present. So that means talking about slavery and privilege and complicity. And the title? Uncomfortable Conversations. Getting uncomfortable is the whole idea because everything great is birthed through discomfort. Just like giving birth, just like training to make it to the NFL, most of our major accomplishments are accompanied by some form of discomfort. So the first chapter, the name game, is it black or African American? One big question he starts with is, what do you call a person of African descent living in America? Do you call them black, African American, colored, Negro? Okay. Hopefully you know that the last two have been dead for some time. Those terms aren't okay, and he doesn't think they're making a comeback. One thing I love about this book is how he goes into the history of every question that he asks us. He wants us to understand the origin of why things are the way they are. So with the labels, he explains how progressive black figures like Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois began to shift from the word colored to the word Negro as a dominant term. He explained how the word Negro held on for decades to the end of the civil rights movement in the early 20th century. Then in the 1960s, black came into its own. One of the main arguments for black, he explains, is that it created a parallel with white. The word black allowed phrases like black and beautiful and black and proud and groups like the black Muslims and black Panthers were birthed. But the word black is not without its criticism because just like colored and Negro are baseless labels, so is black, some argue. So in 1988, 
some black leaders met in Chicago, one of those leaders being former presidential candidate Jesse Jackson, and proposed replacing black with African American. The claim was that black, a label that was originally assigned by slave owners, has become a label to highlight the links between black and dishonesty, black and a lack of virtue, black and a whole bunch of negative connotations. African American, these leaders argued, celebrate the culture and the heritage. You might have also heard the terms POC or BIPOC. This stands for person of color or black indigenous people of color. These labels expand now to include anyone who is non-white. Ocho says he prefers this to saying minorities because people of color actually make up the global majority. So what do you say if you're referring to black people? For him, black is the most inclusive choice, but he says that if you're in doubt, just ask. He compares it to being in school when the teacher would ask the new class if anybody had a particular way of saying their name or even went by a nickname. The teachers would make changes in the roster. Jennifer would become Jen. Fernando would go by Flip. The teacher marked the names down and that was that. They didn't question why the students had a preference as they just respected the choice. So the question of whether to use black or African American is ultimately a preferential one that helps each individual person represent their identity to the world. Okay, Ocho tells the story that happened back in 2015 when Google rolled out its Photos app, which ended up recognizing black faces and tagging them as gorillas. It didn't seem like Google was trying to add an Easter egg to the Photos app, but rather the facial net recognition algorithm had been disproportionately coded and tested on white faces. It didn't recognize a black face because it, no one had thought to teach it to do so. This is what's known as implicit bias. The book reminds us that everybody has implicit bias, so we shouldn't beat ourselves up for the biases that we have. However, we are responsible for our biases, if for no other reason than to make ourselves more conscious of them. What are some examples of how implicit bias shows up and is incredibly harmful for black people? Well, one study showed that white sounding names on job applications were more likely to be called back for interviews, but not just a little bit more likely, twice as likely. And then making it even worse, many organizations would proudly proclaim that they're an equal opportunity employers and that minorities are strongly encouraged to apply. But then these companies would have the same bias when selecting candidates to interview. So, he says, the black applicants would get the false confidence that it's okay to reveal their face on their resumes, and then they end up catching a bias rejection. Then meanwhile, this pro-minority company is wondering why they have no diverse applicants despite their efforts. Why is this so important, you ask? Well, not being called back for an interview means longer periods of unemployment, and longer periods of unemployment mean greater risk of homelessness not to mention what being jobless does to a person's self-esteem and mental health. Additionally, with no job, you have no health insurance. And all this just because of your name? There's definitely a problem here. Another example of implicit bias? In hospitals, bias can literally determine whether a person lives or dies. A 2019 report showed incredible disparities based on race with black women dying from preventable pregnancy-related complications three to four times the rate of white women. Where's the bias here? Well, he explains that black women have long been thought capable of bearing more physical pain, of being less delicate than white women, so they get less attention and are less likely to be treated with dignity by healthcare professionals. I have to admit, this makes me wince just saying it. So what can you do? We can discuss our biases, learn about them, critique them, try to trace where they come from. We will always have biases, but empathetic and considerate people work hard not to let their biases dictate the actions that will harm others. And how can you reduce your bias towards black people? Ocho encourages us to go spend time with people in different social, racial, and ethnic groups. The more we reach out, the easier it gets, he promises. White privilege, another topic that may be one of the most difficult things to understand, but he breaks it down for us in this way. Say we're in a race, and the starting line official holds him back for the first 200 meters, giving his white opponent a 200 meter head start. 
If that were to happen, the only way to level out this race would be to either stop that white person from running or put him on a bike to catch up. This is white privilege in a nutshell. This white privilege goes back to the days of Abraham Lincoln, right when slavery ended and they told the black people that they're free. Go ahead, start running the race of life. But remember that 40 acres and a mule we promised you? Eh, you're not going to get it. It's going back to the white people. Oh, and in your lane, there's going to be hurdles. These hurdles are things like making it hard for you to vote. And there's going to be laws that are going to keep you poor and in debt, keep you segregated. And then in the 60s, the government's going to sign a few laws like the Civil and Voting Rights Act and tell you to just run a little harder and faster and then you'll be able to catch up. So here's the deal. You can't keep shackles and chains on somebody for hundreds of years, then liberate them and think it's all going to be okay and that you're being just and fair. And Acho is very clear. This privilege is about whiteness. It's not about wealth or any other life challenge. This is about having an advantage built into your life due to the color of your skin. Sure, a white person's life may have been difficult, but their skin color is not what has contributed to that difficulty. Think of this as an invisible knapsack, which is what the scholar Peggy McIntosh wrote in 1988. She says it's an invisible package of unearned assets, which I can count on cashing in each day, but which I was meant to remain oblivious about. White privilege is like an invisible, weightless knapsack of special provisions, maps, passports, code books, visas, clothes, tools, and blank checks. So what is this backpack really? Well, for white people, it's the power of feeling normal. It's the ability to walk into a store and see product displays that cater to you. It's turning on the TV to see people who look like you, representing you in all walks of life. It's passing the corner office at work and seeing someone who could have been you once upon a time and finding mentors who see themselves in you. It's never wondering if your name is too white to get a call back. Here's another analogy. For those of you familiar with sports, he says it's like always being the visiting team. The other team has a stadium full of fans cheering for them. The referees are going to lean calls in their favor. You know the home team's locker room and equipment are top notch and the visitors stuff, well, not so much. The home team is set up to win. The road team, good luck. Do your best in this difficult environment. To be really clear, white privilege is being the home team. Another part is the omnipresent benefit of the doubt. White people get to move through the world without being profiled or worrying the police might harass them just because of the color of their skin. White people aren't worried about not getting shown a nice apartment or not getting a loan because of their skin color. White people get the presumption of innocence until proven guilty in our justice system. I think this is a very critical part of what we need to do in order to begin making some shifts around racism. I know I don't want to look back on my life and know that I lived it stepping on the necks and backs of a whole group of people, and I'm guessing you don't either. If you're watching this video, you're probably a really good person. You probably don't consider yourself a racist, or at least you acknowledge that racism exists, and you might even go out of your way to be an ally. But we just have to do more and acknowledging this invisible knapsack full of privilege and then doing something about it is a really important first step. Okay, so the next chapter he goes into is about cultural appropriation. This is the adoption of an element or elements of one culture or identity by members of another culture or identity. Usually it occurs with the dominant culture adopting or taking credit for elements of a disadvantaged culture. He gives some good examples. When Kim Kardashian did a social media post about her Beau Derrick braids. However, those braids were actually patterned after the styles of the Fulani people of West Africa. And if you don't know who Beau Derrick is, I'll give you a hint. She's white, blonde, blue-eyed. So what's the issue with this? Acho compares it to plagiarism. Plagiarism is a really big deal. It can get you kicked out of school. And while it might be flattering at times, it's also stealing. So essentially, white people decide that they like something that originated from the black community or the African culture, and then they steal it because they don't give the credit where the credit is due. And there's a double standard here. 
so white people can enjoy the best parts of black culture and show love for it, but still remain prejudiced and perpetuate racial stereotypes. You want some more examples? Think of Little Richard inventing rock and roll, but then Elvis being considered the king of rock and roll. Think of jazz that's developed in the black community, and then Kenny G being the most famous contemporary jazz artist. Think of hip hop being born in the Bronx, which originated as an art form meant to draw attention to the struggle of people of color. And then Eminem, a white rapper being the highest selling artist of all time. Then how can white people engage in black culture? He says celebrate and acknowledge it as black culture. Oh, and by the way, blackface is never okay. Never. The next part we're going to talk about, the myth of the angry black man. This is a dangerous myth that to this day has tragic consequences for the black community, black men especially. This is an example of what happens when implicit biases are absorbed and then become stereotypes, which make them permanent biases. So white people's fear of the black man being angry and as such being violent or dangerous is pervasive in our society. It's untrue and it's unfair. It's unfair that we perpetuate this myth that black men are dangerous any more than white men are dangerous. But Acho explains the anger part and he says, well, that's partially true. But imagine for a moment that you were a slave and you watched black women that you loved and respected be continually sexually exploited by white men. And imagine if that woman was who you claimed as your wife because you really weren't allowed to marry. She was raped by your white master. She gave birth to his child and there was nothing you could do about it. You'd be angry and hurt also. And then if you so much as accidentally looked the wrong way at a white woman, you were accused of violating her respect and could be captured, beaten or lynched. And when you finally got free, the things they told you you were going to get, you never got. Instead, you continue to face significant discrimination, cruelty, and obstacles just to live your life. You know you would be angry too. But that's not really the point. The point is that white people have created this mythical, dangerous black man. We saw it just last year when Amy Cooper called the cops on a bird watcher in Central Park who wanted her to leash her illegally unleashed dog. What did she do? She called 911 and said, there's a black man who's threatening my life. Luckily, the whole situation was caught on video or else the cops would have most likely believed her. Then there's Jennifer S who called the police on two black men who were legally barbecuing in Oakland. Come quick, she said, I'm really scared. If you be, want to be honest with yourself, imagine how you would feel if you were walking on the street and it was starting to get dark and you saw two black men walking near you. You would probably admit to having some anxiety or apprehension about it. This is the part of our biases that we need to acknowledge and own. This is the part we need to face up to. This is what makes George Floyd possible or Trayvon Martin possible because anytime someone is seen as a threat, they're first seen as black. The next chapter, a big nope, the N word. No, white people cannot use it. This word is synonymous with being stupid, being a slave, reminding black people that white people own them. This is what hearing the N-word does when white people say it. So why do black people say it? Many black people argue that using the N-word is a way to empty of it some of its original malice, to reclaim it, to take it back. Variations have included dropping the harsh ER and ending the word with an A. There's some interesting history around this word, so check out the depth when you read the book. But I have to say, I personally agree with Maya Angelou when she compared the N-word to poison. She didn't want it used at all by white people or by black people. She said, when I see a bottle and it says poison, then I know what it is. The bottle is nothing, but the content is poison. If I pour that content into Bavarian crystal, it's still poison. I personally don't like the N-word. I don't like my kids listening to it in their songs. I don't like hearing anybody say it, but I know it's not my call, nor is it my place to judge if black people choose to use it or not. The bottom line is white people don't say it. Okay, the back half of the book goes into describing and explaining the deep systems that continue to uphold our racist society. 
It's things like our justice system, laws, policies, access or lack to opportunity. To get a deeper understanding of the systemic and institutional racism that exists in America, check out our video on the book Cast by Isabel Wilkerson. I'll put a link in the description. Essentially, we have to acknowledge that the very structure America is built on is a racist one, and it continues to have processes to allow those with more power to squash those with less power. I want to end with how to be an ally, because I think that's where we are and that's what we have available to us as white people. Right now, there's words like ally, advocate, and accomplice. They're all varying ways that white people can step up and be part of the fight against racism, give support to black people in America, people of color in our communities. The simple definition of an ally is somebody from an empowered group who asks to help an oppressed group, even if it costs them the benefits of their power. And I think that's the key right there. We need to be willing to let go of some of our power that's been afforded to us simply because of the color of our skin in order to spread that power out and give everybody access to it. This looks like speaking up when you notice microaggressions and unconscious biases coming out in your workplace or in your families. It's educating and exposing yourself to black culture. It's understanding the depth and breadth of black history. Ocho provides so many resources, books to read, websites to visit, movies to watch. There's a link to some of these in the description. Make it a priority. You do want to be careful of becoming the white savior. Don't let your allyship be motivated by your desire to make you feel good, look good, or even your desire to save black people because they can't save themselves. He tells us we need to make sure that our work and our allyship comes from a pure place. It starts with ourselves. We each individually need to explore how comfortable we are holding other white people accountable. Ask yourself, are you willing to speak up even to people who are close to you when you see them saying and doing something racist or discriminatory? I want to end with a story that happened to me just a few months ago. My team and I were planning out our books for this upcoming book club season. We had several book possibilities on the list, and most of them were by black authors and tied to issues of race and racial discrimination. We were planning the books in September, so racial tensions were still very much alive from the summer. And I made a comment to my team. Do we really want to pick all these books on race and racism? What if our community gets bored with this topic and they don't want to attend these sessions? The minute I said it, I knew exactly how terrible it was, and I stopped myself. I looked at my team and said, I can't believe I just said that. Black people in America don't have a chance to just get bored and pick another book. They don't have that luxury. That's white privilege. That's being a part-time ally and not going all in. We need to stay in this. This book is a great way to expose ourselves to the nuance, the history, and the complexity of the issue that we're facing. And this book gives us specific action items to do in order to be a part of the solution, to be a part of the fight, to be an ally. If you like this video, please hit that thumbs up button and give us a like. Don't forget to subscribe. We're working hard to grow our content on the topics and ideas that matter most to us right now. Whether you're leading an organization, leading your family, or just leading yourself to live a best life, we would love to be a part of it. Thank you so much for joining me. I know your time is precious and I really appreciate you've spent it with me.